Hello and welcome to the Alatea Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. Today, I'm going to be talking to Bill Farron Price. Bill is a senior research fellow and head of gas research at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Until early 2023, he was the director, head of global energy macro research at Enveris, a leading US oil and gas data analytics firm. Mr. Farron Price has reported and researched the Middle East energy industry for 25 years as a specialist journalist and for the past 16 years in research and in advisory roles. Uh, Bill, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Thanks, Stephen. Well, you are no stranger, really, to the foundation, are you? You've been involved with our energy research series, um, well, for, for a long time, soon after its formation, in fact. What are your memories of the early days of the foundation? Yeah, it's interesting. I when I cast my mind back, I first met um, His Excellency Abdullah bin Hamad al in the mid 90s when he was uh, an, an OPEC minister. Um, and he, he he was one of the most and is one of the most accessible and thoughtful policymakers of that generation. Um, so when he founded the when he set up the foundation, it was a it was a natural extension of that, really creating a space um, for research uh, and debate on key energy issues. Um, as you said, the, the early days, I remember we I helped establish that uh, research series, but there are a lot of other things going on um, at the foundation as well. There's the, the, the CEO roundtables, um, various ad hoc meetings, uh, and, and he had the pull to be able to get the top um, people in, in the global energy industry into the room. Uh, and I think um, it's it's really been extremely successful. Yeah, I, I do too. And uh, I, I absolutely second your thoughts about His Excellency. Uh, and he still has a reputation and the pull to get the top people in the world uh, around tables. You're absolutely right. But uh, let's move to the Oxford Institute and how it conducts its gas research. For instance, do you uh, utilise large macroeconomic models to balance supply and demand for gas? Yeah, we well, we do a bit of that. I mean, the gas program at the Institute is is the largest research program that it runs, uh, both in terms of its output, the number of, of research fellows that are that are working on it. Um, I think we're known best for our detailed bottom up um, data gathering and analysis of the European gas market, um, and but also global LNG uh, and the key drivers of that market as well. Um, We've recently bolstered our, our modelling capacity uh, and we're working on adding um, some price modelling to, to the work we do on the gas market, global gas market um, and also primary energy, which is a, almost these days a prerequisite for anybody who's trying to understand um, the energy transition uh, and what that means for, for hydrocarbons, particularly gas. But we're also, I would say, expert on, on regulation, particularly uh, policy making and regulation in the European perspective, um, trying to figure out um, policies as regards uh, hydrogen, uh, new 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 gases f fuels that will will be part of the transition in, in in the years ahead. Now, global LNG supply is expected to expand by twenty five percent between twenty two and twenty six, with seventy percent of the supply increase concentrated in those last two years, 2025 and 2026. And you can dispute those figures or uh, talk more about them, but we are hearing about risk premiums being paid for gas to Europe. Is there a, a genuine supply risk that is factored into LNG supplies in addition to the <laughs> rising insurance rate for the Red Sea? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think actually, the Red Sea situation is not so much a supply risk. It's it's a it's an optimization opportunity, or it's a it, it's certainly affecting trade flows. Um, I think maybe I would describe it as a logistics risk. Um, the, the the challenge is that you can still send those ships uh, into the Atlantic Basin. It just takes longer, and therefore you need more ships to deliver the same amount of LNG in a certain time frame. I mean, I definitely think that that's going to be a challenge, um, but I I think there is also the opportunity within the global LNG uh, trading picture to actually just optimize um, so that 
LNG that's actually already in the Atlantic Basin, mostly coming from the US, stays there. Um, and and uh, Qatar and its uh, fantastic um, export capacity serves increasingly serves Asia. And actually, we, we have actually seen, uh, you know, uh, Qatar as a proportion of European LNG imports is actually still um, is is relatively low, I would say. So so I don't think it's it's dramatic. I also think politically the prospects for resolving the the um the the, the insecurity in the red sea are probably uh political they, it, yeah. it will not be solved militarily i don't think it, there is any way to do to achieve that um the houthis are are resilient and and i think this will have to be solved on a political level at, at, at the end of the day yeah i think that's exactly right uh, and so you're saying that there isn't a supply risk but we just need more ships to carry the LNG. I think so. And 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 if you look at if you look at the spikes we've seen in prices that over the last two or three years, um, the, the the Ukraine war and so on, it, it was to do with the loss of supply. Um and, and that has not happened in this case. It's just gonna there might be some delay, but it but but frankly it's a logistics challenge, not nothing else. Okay. Well, in January, uh, President Biden threw uh, a spanner in the gas works with a temporary pause on pending LNG export projects such as gas terminals. That's not an export ban, but it does freeze a few uh, proposed, major proposed uh, but unapproved projects that would benefit countries which don't have a free trade agreement with America. Um, the states has placed therefore a hold on new LNG export terminals. Why have they done that? Are, are they for green reasons? Well, in other words, to slow down fossil fuel exports due to domestic climate change pressure? I, I think this is an election year and, and I think that sort of move is is purely political, designed to to placate to, to placate some of those uh, on on the left of the of the Democratic Party. Um I I don't think it has an immediate impact on on LNG balances, to be honest. It's 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 more of a factor that would affect projects that would come on stream after 2030. Um, I think it is significant and it is important because it doesn't just affect new projects, it's, it, it affects um, extensions for existing um, plans, projects. But I would imagine that this kind of measure would be uh, not permanent and it would probably get um, uh, unfrozen probably in 2025. So it could actually be a little bit of a red herring. I, I, I'm not sure that it's something that should be on the supply risk radar, uh, at least for this decade. OK, a sort of green herring, uh, in other words. Green herring, yes. <laughs> the one. EU may eventually impose uh, a cross-border export tariff on imports of gas. How will that affect the competitive position of LNG compared, say, uh, to Norwegian gas? Well, I, yeah, this is, a, this is an odd one. I, I've seen these reports about Germany talking about um, some sort of tariff for for exports. I, th I I think this is unlikely to be approved by Brussels because it would uh, it would go against the, the principles of of the single market for for gas in Europe. I think that the major export destination for gas in Europe is 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 probably Ukraine, and that is uh, probably going to be more. A question of storage in Ukraine. I I think it's unlikely that any tariffs would be raised on that. So I think again, I I think this is probably unlikely to come to pass. Um, and and it's interesting. It, we, we've seen reports of it, but it hasn't. I don't think it's a, a solid plan as yet. Okay. Well, gas prices in Europe have fallen enough, as you know, in recent weeks to reignite some competition between gas and coal in the power sector. Does coal to gas and gas to coal switching take place in some national economies? Uh, yes, it could do. I mean, there's. I, I think this is, I mean, most coal-fired power is is in the process of being decommissioned in, in Europe. I mean, there's still some, some coal power in Poland, um, in Greece, uh, maybe China. some other, in other Central European countries. But I, I think, um, Gas at current prices is 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 pretty uh, pretty competitive, but but most yeah. important is that you know Europe has committed to to um, uh, eliminating coal 
um, except in, in extremists, in, in, in unless we have a very cold snap during winter or so on. Uh, and I think that 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 process is is un, is it will continue. I think it's very different in in countries like India, um, and China, and and other developing economies where where uh, where coal is 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 prevalent and and much more available. Qatar has always considered itself the lowest cost producer of LNG due to its credits taken for wet gas byproducts and favourable capital cost investments. Is that still the case in the LNG competition? Yeah, I think Qatar is always going to be up there on the the low cost leaderboard um, globally, uh, globally, and because of its NGLs, because of the concentration of its upstream in in one location in the North Field, and also of course because of the huge economies of scale that it operates at. Um, but I would say also the U.S. has a has a, a world scale um, resource base for gas as well. Uh, and well capitalized um, LNG developers. So th- the real challenge in the US is is not so much to do with the, the cost of production at the wellhead, it's more to do with the challenge of establishing sufficient pipeline capacity to transport gas from the point of production inland to the to the to the Gulf Coast uh, terminals. Um, so I, I I think it's it's it is a bit dynamic, but I think Qatar uh, is always going to be going to be up there at the top. Taking aside the other LNG producers and coal, where do you think the competition will come from for LNG? Will it be uh, power from solar and wind farms? Yeah, I think. I mean, we're seeing renewables growing very fast in some geographies. In in China, the the development of solar is going to hit their their long term target early this year, probably. Um, and we've seen, you know, the UK has has built out its offshore wind um, uh, very very quickly. Indeed, it's probably the the, the leading offshore wind power in the world. Um, the problem with renewables, and it's not it's not a new problem. It's it's an old one. Is is intermittency, uh, yes. and and, and, and of storage course, too. Yes, storage intermittency, the inability to to um, to store energy. Uh, is is problematic, and until that's resolved, you know, LNG um, slash gas will have a key um, role in in offering cover for that sort of intermittency in terms of dispatchable power. Uh, and and I think there's no prospect that of that being solved on on a on a on a world scale at the moment. So uh, I think power uh, is going to be the electrification of everything. Is going to require more gas for longer. Yeah. Well, at, at COP28, uh, as you know, delegates talked about what they called the energy trilemma. That's uh, the need for energy to be affordable, sustainable, and secure. Uh, how does LNG fit into squaring that trilemma? Do you know what? I, I think of the trilemma, security is what drives LNG. And it's 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 an outsized. Uh, if, if if you imagine a stool with three legs, it's it's the biggest it's the biggest leg, um, in, in my opinion, for LNG. And the reason is that while the other two are important, sustainability, of course, is important in the longer term, uh, and price is important. But what we've discovered over the last few years, particularly in the wake of Ukraine uh, and the loss of Russian pipeline supply into Europe, in in large part is that keeping the lights on is the most important thing. Uh, and 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 it was quite clear that the global gas market was prepared to pay um, whatever price they needed to secure their supply, at least in um, in, in, in Europe. And so I, I think the way to view LNG uh, is that it, it provides that buffer, um, that security of supply, that that fungible product that can be moved around in ships to the places of highest demand, uh, and that's what is absolutely underpinning um, LNG's long-term prospects. So, so in talking uh, about demand and global demand for natural gas in the next twenty-five years, is that likely to be driven up by population growth, even though population growth is slowing, or down because of the move? towards non-fossil fuels for electricity generation? I think I, I think 
well, demography is interesting because, of course, you know, you're starting to see um, birth rates fall in, in some major economies. And, and that's that's one factor. And, and Japan and China. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and I think what we'll probably see is um, increased efficiency over that period as well. But but the point I, I raised earlier about the electrification of everything is important and and, in, and until and we're very far away from from um, being able to cover power demand from from uh, low carbonized sources. So I until that becomes more possible, I think the role for, for gas is strong and, and, and we can see that in our own um, in our own long term forecast to 2050. Mm. Um, I so my answer, my one word answer to your question is uh, I think gas demand is going to go up. Well, um, Europe's energy transition on that uh, basis may push the continent off gas faster than anticipated, which sounds like an exam question, doesn't it, Bill? So discuss <laughs> what yeah. you think. Yeah. Can, well, you, can you cut through the confusion for us and detail your supply and demand forecasts? Yeah, I think I think you, you feel on something important here, which is that in, in developed industrialised economies like Europe, like the US, um, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, you, we would expect to see um, gas demand flat to falling over over the next 25 years. But the, but the point is that um, gas demand in developing countries like China, like the Middle East, uh, and also possibly even the US as well, uh, particularly countries where a lot of this gas actually comes from, we would expect to see still still growing and, and in some cases growing quite strongly. So the overall profile is upwards. Um, it ob Obviously, you're right. It depends upon whether you think um, decarbonisation and the energy transition um, play out as as targeted by organisations like, you know, like by COP20, by the COP28 process. Uh, and there are some pretty uh, aggressive targets in there. Um, I I take the view that that some of this will happen, but probably not all of it. Um, and and that leaves quite a big space for for gas to fill um, from the medium into the longer term. Well, global warming has passed the 1.5 uh, degrees target, heading towards two uh, centigrade. Uh, what which technologies do you expect? To, to be prominent now in tackling what seems to be a more urgent and a faster pace climate change, direct air capture, carbon capture, hydrogen as an energy carrier, for instance? Well, I mean, the diplomatic answer to that question is, well, all of them, <laughs> um, they'll all play a role. And actually, we, we need all of them to play a role. Um, but there is no silver bullet. And, and I, think, I think the challenge that's been identified correctly um, by by realists is that you know a lot of these um, technologies are, are not necessarily scalable uh, for various reasons. Um, they are not particularly economic, so they require um, they, they require a level of state subsidy or, or government um, subsidies uh, th that that makes them really unaffordable at a time when we're still. Um, in the global economy, recovering That's, from COVID. That, that, is, and, that, that is so yeah. right. And do you think yeah. some governments and some chancellors, some money men are realising this and pulling back uh, from the attempts because the dates were too optimistic? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's I, you can see that even um, in, I, as I said, it's an election year. We've got elections in Germany, France, um, the EU, UK, US, and you can see it this watering down of commitments, um, it's on left and right. And I would argue, you know, some of this energy transition stuff is probably uh, on the front line of the of, of the culture wars. And, and we would expect to see populist parties, particularly on the right, want to push back even further than some of the mainstream parties. So I think whichever way you slice or dice it, the, the call on hydrocarbons, particularly gas, less so oil, I would say, but particularly gas, is going to be sustained at a higher level 
than we would have thought even last year. And that's that's because of this this uh, desire to push back on some of the, um, the, the, the you know some of the tax and costs around the transition that are being imposed on uh, consumers. That there's a there's a there's a funding problem, not just at the individual level, at the consumer or the farmer or whatever, but it's also a, a funding problem at government level because uh, countries are heavily indebted as a result of of uh, of um, the, the, uh, the you know the follow through from COVID, but they are also facing new calls on 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 spending, particularly on the military in Europe, uh, and and this is going to have to compete with um, uh, with sovereign governments' desire to push through a transition commitment, even yeah. though they say the right things and 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 I believe that they are committed to it um, when it comes. But they to just pop, can't afford it. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to afford it, and and it comes. It's it's going to, it's it's going to be a an issue that we see more and more of through this year because of the elections that we're about to have. Bill, that's a, a cracking answer. So thank you for that. Uh, on behalf of the Alatia Foundation, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today and giving all the listeners uh, your expert views about how the LNG market will develop in the next few years. The Foundation uh, looks forward very much to continuing this conversation with you in the near future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, very much enjoyed the conversation and look forward to more of the same. And thank you for listening. Stay tuned for the next Alatia podcast interview in the coming weeks and be sure to keep up to date with all of our latest publications through our website, www.aptarfoundation.org and X, formerly known as Twitter. From me, Stephen Cole. Bye-bye.